we are recording, we should be good to go. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, today is January 11th. Sorry, I had to think there for a second. 2024. We are in Sanger second floor for folks that uh, want to join us in future sessions. Uh, thanks for joining us online. The CE code is here. will also be posted at the end of the session. Um, so today is sponsored by the Division of Geriatric Medicine. Uh, we have an external speaker, Dr. Lee Linquist, who's going to be talking to us about aging in place in the geriatric multiverse. Dr. Linquist is a geriatrician and chief of the Division of Geriatrics at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. She's a native of Chicago, obtained her MD from Northwestern University, followed by internal medicine residency and geriatric fellowship at the McGaw Medical Center associated with Northwestern University. She went on to obtain her NPH in negotiating, I think we just, MBA, sorry. Your MBA was in negotiating later from the Kellogg School of Management in 2010. She's board certified in internal medicine, geriatric medicine, and is a certified medical director through the American Board of Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. Her research interest has focused predominantly on uh, prognosis, as well as now most recently in artificial intelligence and caregiver education. She has had three large PCORI awards, um, one, an Improving Health System Award uh, through Plan Your Lifespan, an Open Science Award, and a Dissemination Award. She's gone on to uh, then receive multiple NIH awards and has been the principal investigator on three R01 grants uh, that she'll be talking a little bit about today. She also provides clinical care in older adults in the geriatrics clinic and previously was the clinical practice director in charge of all outpatient geriatric operations at Northwestern. She's also the medical director of the Claire at Water Tower, a CMS five-star continuing care retirement community that encompasses independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, memory, and long-term care. Help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Lee Linkton. Okay. That one? Ah, Oh, I got Hold it. One second. There we go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me, you guys. This has been such a fun uh, group to get to meet, and you guys are fantastic here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about aging in place in the geriatrics multiverse. Da da da. Um, so these are seniors. Uh, I hope somebody has seen a senior in their life. Um, and these are my grandparents. So I start off every talk talking um, because they're the people who inspired me to go into geriatrics. And so my glorious purpose in life has, to, has been to help seniors age in place. So what do we think about when we think about aging in place? And the CDC thinks of it as being ability to live in one's own home and community safely, independently, and comfortably, um, regardless of age. And we know that seniors do very good in their own homes. Um, they're volunteering a lot, they're loving life, um, they have fewer physical problems and so forth. Um, and just because it's fun, I am a super fan of Loki and Marvel, okay? So we need more fun in our lives. So um, I actually use Loki as one of my examples for my research because it does fit um, what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, Loki has had two series um, come out, two seasons, and he is the brother of Thor, and his job um, during the seasons has been to um, have a timeline that he has to trim off where people branch. So a timeline is kind of where we start and where we are living our lives, but then different parts of us kind of fall off. And there's reasons why people will fall off, which is considered a nexus. So what makes you fall off your timeline? Um, and so if you think about older adults, um, what makes you no longer able to live in your own home? So you're living at home, you're loving life, and then there's something that causes you to fall off of your timeline of living at home. And so my early research, we came up with this idea of advanced life events or ales, who doesn't like a good beer in their life. <laughs> um, and so beers was already taken, so we went with ales. And so we talked to um, a bunch of seniors as far as focus groups and qualitative um, analysis. And we found that people identified hospitalizations, falls and functional loss, and dementia and cognitive loss as three major reasons 
why people would no longer be able to live at home. And so you can think about your own um, grandparents or patients that you know, you know, I've had to live in the same walk up for 30 years, I've done various things, but who knows when I'm going to fall, it's going to be, um, it won't be a slow thing. You know, uh, my dad has Alzheimer's um, and we had to put him in and she had to put him in a nursing home. Um, she just never got into the reality of her husband being placed in a nursing home. Um, and so we do know that older adults are hospitalized. Think about your own census um, of patients that you're seeing. They're being hospitalized. They fall. Um, they develop Alzheimer's disease. And so it's not a case of if, but it's a case of when. And so, so many times in my geriatrics clinic, I've seen patients that we see, you know, they're doing fine and then they fall and then the family has to run around and figure out what to do. And I'm like, you know, why are we always waiting for this critical event? Let's plan ahead for when you'll be hospitalized prior to ever getting hospitalized. So we got funding from both the NIA and PCORI um, about what should seniors know to plan? Because if we can get our seniors to plan ahead for when they'll need help, it'll be much easier for us to get them discharged and to follow their wishes. So we uh, connected with a bunch of different partners um, and we created this thing called Plan Your Lifespan. Um, freely available, publicly available, housed at Northwestern. Um, I get no money from it other than from grant funding and anyone can use it. So what it is is that um, we built it so that people can go through it from a perspective of a senior. It's all in large font. Um, easy to click through, and we grouped it into um, what people will need to know as they grow older. And so I don't think of it necessarily as end of life. People always get mad at me, like, this is all end of life. This is more the fourth quarter, if anyone's a big football fan. So this is the 20 years before you die, um, when you're going to need help in the home, you're going to need, you know, you may be hospitalized and need subacute rehab. So we talk about, you know, what if you are hospitalized? Um, what if I'm not ready to return home? What is the difference between acute rehab or subacute rehab? Um, and then we talk about what the different parts are. And then we actually say, you know, what choices can I make now? Um, so, you know, here's a website. So we actually link to national websites that people can visit. Um, this one goes to Medicare.NursingHomeCompare. Um, and it allows people to look at their area nursing homes or SNFs and see which ones are one star versus three star, um, which ones are closer to them so far. And then they can actually type in um, which nursing homes they prefer. And usually people will type in multiple nursing homes. Um, and this kind of goes along the lines of being almost a virtual social worker because so many patients don't have um, interactions with social work as far as getting connected with local resources. So on this one, you can actually type in your zip code um, and they'll give you the area agencies or support services in your neighborhood. Um, it also connects you with things like local villages. So villages are a grassroots movement um, where seniors are helping seniors in the community and they're all over the country. So you can actually click on it and see if there's one in your neighborhood. Um, we also have videos um, that lead off every unit or every section where a senior has actually talked about what it was like um, being hospitalized or falling and relying on skilled nursing care and so forth. So it's actually developed by seniors, uh, talked about with seniors um, for a senior viewpoint. Um, we also include things like memory loss. You know, <laughs> what happens if you get memory loss, right? And so one thing that we found was that many people said, you know, I don't want anyone to move in with me. I'm going to move in with my son. Um, and in this case, Peter Bowling. Um, so who, who wants to move in with Peter Bowling and live in his beautiful, luxurious mansion, right? Um, so the other thing is, you know, I want to stay. And so people will actually click off or say, I want to live with my son or I want to live with my daughter because we don't always have these conversations. You know, when you're, you know, 88 years old and you can no longer live at home, where do you want to do? You know, what do you want to do? Um, and that's where we actually, when we were doing these interviews and talking to a lot of seniors and with our, our patient panel and our advisory committees, um, a lot of seniors had never talked about it with their loved ones. So, you know, it could be that you have not talked to Peter Bowling that you ought to move in with him um, or your um, parents have not talked to you. And we actually found many times family members said, you know, they said, oh, I didn't know mom wanted to move in with me. She wants to move in with me. What? What? You know, so it was a shock 
to the families, but the seniors were like, yeah, I'm moving in with my mom or with my daughter. Um, so to kind of facilitate this, we actually have it so that this can be channeled to families, to loved ones, et cetera, um, by email. So you can actually email your summary at the end after you go through the website so that your loved ones have a copy. So if you're ever hospitalized, if the seniors ever hospitalized, or if they develop memory loss, there's a list of their wishes um, or kind of guidelines um, so that the family caregiver doesn't have to go running around at the last minute. Um, and so the other sections that we've had to add to has been finances, just because so many times we heard that that patients thought Medicare covers everything, which we know, unfortunately, it doesn't. Um, the other thing, too, is that you can print this up um, and also save it so that you can return to it at any time. So we developed this website. Um, we were pretty you know, happy with it. And so we got funding to do a randomized control trial of about 400 seniors, and they were provided with Plan Your Lifespan. And what we did is that... Um, we enrolled the senior, we uh, randomized them to either an attention control group or an intervention group, which was Plan Your Lifespan. And then we followed them. And what we found is that it improved, significantly improved hospital discharge knowledge. People knew what they wanted to go afterwards. Um, it was great. People were like, oh, I know I want to go to a sniff. I would prefer a five-star one. Um, and I don't want to do anything other than subacute rehab there. And you're just like, yeah, that's what we want to hear. Um, people were really good at communicating, so they were able to tell that make their plans and also communicate their plans. Um, and so we tested it, um, definitely significant results. And actually, Plan Your Lifespan now um, has had a second rendition. When we first started it, which was back around 2010, um, what was happening was is that people were using less scrolling devices and more clicking devices. And so with the sign of the times, we had to edit it so it was available on a mobile app or a mobile website, um, as well as more scrolling. Um, and we're also seeing a lot more technology use among our seniors. Um, so we received additional funding to do dissemination. And I love partnering with communities. Seniors in the communities have the greatest networks. Um, so we disseminated via a train the trainer approach um, where we trained one caregiver or one patient partner and then she went off and trained another patient partner and then she went off and trained additional patient partners. And then our partners, um, which are all a bunch of community living seniors, um, kept track of when they did an activity, either you know a coffee clutch they met up with, you know, their walking group or um, simple things like, you know, a book club or an aqua aerobics where they would talk about things. And so what we found is that after uh, one week activity um, and one month activity, we actually had over 3,000 or 300,000 users um, at the end of the study. And so we were very excited about that. And so um, with this study, we had actually over 300,000 hits in six months. And this is just a map of the users at that time. Since then, um, and so, yeah, we went international, right? You guys, all the way to South Africa, Brazil. Um, and me being a Midwesterner, and I'm like, oh, wow, people are visiting my work. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, so in addition, what was wild was that Epic National reached out to me um, and it asked if it could be incorporated as a patient resource. So you'll actually find a link to Plan Your Lifespan um, at the bottom of the patient my chart pages. Um, and then I got elected to the Epic National Advisory Board, um, which is a really fun group to play around with. So now that we've done this, um, we actually said, you know, is there a way that we can prune these branches? And this gets back to Loki um, and my earlier analogy about the multiverse. Can we make it so that people do not fall off the timeline? What leads people to variant off of this aging in place timeline? And then if you ever experience a hospitalization, can we get you to return home? So we're actually in the midst of this study. This is an R01 um, where we're following a cohort of about 295 seniors. We have 96% retention um, at 36 months. So we're doing really good. I'm very proud of our group. Um, and we've been following them every six months for 42 months. Um, and that was kind of exciting for us because we actually had started enrolling them and we're following them and we had to convert from an in-person study to an online um, phone study because of COVID. 
Um, and so with this testing, we actually did baseline testing with them and a series of cognition tests, um, as well as looking at like 100 different variables as to what's causing them to fall off the timeline. And then we followed them for every six months. Some of the results that we've had so far have been fascinating because, um, for instance, with cognition, since these people have had almost neuropsych testing done completely, um, we found that certain parts of cognition actually affect how people plan. So in order to have a good plan for what you're going to need down the road when you are in need of help, um, you have to have actually adequate inductive reasoning and working memory. Um, but you don't need long-term memory, which I always joke at because you don't need to remember the plans. You just have to make them um, and tell somebody about it. Uh, and you also don't need to have less verbal ability or processing speed. So it's that inductive reasoning and working memory that's necessary for people to complete long-term planning. Um, and so we actually came to the conclusion that many people do not actually assess or notice when inductive reasoning or working memory is lapsing. So that's something that people should be more cognitive about. One of the other fun things that we saw was that um, when asked if they had made decisions about post-hospitalization rehab preferences, uh, people that had higher number of chronic conditions, people who had been hospitalized, already kind of had an idea, this is what I want to do. Uh, people that had sufficient social support, um, as well as adequate self-efficacy, um, were more aligned with knowing what their preference would be. And when I talk about self-efficacy, that's the belief that you're able to do a task. And we always have seniors in our clinics or in home care that say, I can do it, I can do it, or even your parents might say this, or grandparents. Um, but what's fascinating is that COVID actually caused most of our patients to be self-reliant and homebound. Um, and so what we found, because we did self-efficacy testing before and after, or before and during COVID or post-COVID, um, we found that before COVID, people were like, I don't think I'll be able to do that on my own. I don't think I'll be able to grocery shop. I could never order things online. Um, and then after COVID, um, we actually found that, and I say after loosely, um, this was about um, probably about a year after, um, we actually found that people had a higher self-efficacy saying, you know what, I can age in place because I just did it during COVID, right? So I should not have a problem doing these tasks. And so it definitely gave a lot of people a boost. Um, but on that aspect, we've seen a lot of people changing their minds. So we've seen people that have developed else. If you, if you developed Alzheimer's and you could no longer live independently in your home, have you decided what living preference you would be? Um, so, you know, remove, remain in your home, move in with family long-term care. What we see is that every six months, people are changing their mind. Um, and, you know, I would go to an assisted living. I would like to stay at home as long as possible. I don't know. Um, so people are almost circling. And it kind of comes down to this idea of decision permanence. And so as we keep progressing out, what we're seeing is it's almost like a musical chairs where people are kind of going around, around, around until they finally decide. And that decision permanence starts to um, improve or people become more permanent in their decision over time. Um, and as their health worsens, they start making serious decisions about it. So you made your plan. Now let's do it, right? How many people say, okay, you need help in your home? And what does the senior always say? No, right? It drives me nuts. Ah. So I actually got R01 funding to tackle convincing older adults um, who are resistant <laughs> to accepting help. I know, right? Isn't that fun? Um, so when I've said to patients, including my own parents, you need to start implementing these plans. We need to hire a homemaker. We need to hire somebody to come in. Um, older adults tend to be resistant. I can do it. I can do it. Um, so there's this constant struggle um, between family members, between doctors, providers, nurses, you name it, PAs. So one thing that I found out with my training is that for decades, business schools have been training executives on negotiation and dispute resolution. Um, and our Kellogg School is a huge innovator, but um, our medical school doesn't teach it. So it's actually taught in our communication school. It's taught in every school except for music and medical school. So I started talking to people and not many people had had formal negotiation training. Um, so I said, you know what, let's try teaching caregivers of older adults how to negotiate using business tactics, right? How much fun would that be? 
Um, so we actually started talking um, more to the family caregivers and asking them where their biggest conflicts were. And so what we found out was that it's, it's the providers, it's the healthcare system. Um, it frustrates a lot of family caregivers. You know, general practitioner is hard to get a hold of, sometimes um, resulting in confusion. Um, there's been people that say, I have to be my mother's voice. I have to be the advocate. Um, I have to be a helico helicopter advocate. Otherwise, there have been some serious flaws due to the system. So um, we started thinking about how people negotiate. Um, this is one of my favorite um, Norcraft and Neil model. So you can actually think about where your conflict behavior is as a provider. Are you one that will go head on and start, listen, this is what's wrong. We need to get you moved in. That's it. Um, or are you one of the doctors that prefers not to call until things have cooled down a lot? Um, and so it's actually mapped out your conflict behavior style is actually mapped out on assertiveness as well as cooperativeness. So if you are very assertive and uncooperative, um, you can be very competing. Um, if you're unassertive and uncooperative, that's like one of the worst places to be is that blue one because you're avoiding anything. Um, you're not going to be calling back that patient. The patient will keep on calling and sending epic messages. <laughs> which I believe there might be someone in the audience with 900 messages as we speak. So the fun thing is, is that you actually want to be more in the middle of compromising or collaborating. Um, so if we can get people to move away from avoiding um, towards more compromising and collaborating, that's kind of the goal that we want to go to. Um, so this column on the right is the Dutch test, which is where you can actually find where you sit. So when I have a conflict at work, I do the following. I give in to the other party. You know, I push my own point of view so you can be more forcing at times. But um, what we ended up doing is that I decided that we would start training hospitalists how to negotiate um, because our hospitalists were getting beaten up a lot on the wards. And what we found, um, this was an in-person um, study that we did um, where we actually taught them in a one-hour session how to negotiate. And what we found is that we found significant changes in how people negotiate post um, our workshop. And so people were uh, much less forcing as well as less avoidant. So we repeated that training with case managers as well as with nurses, and we found significant improvement with all of them. So people benefit um, with, their, with learning how to negotiate in their daily lives. So um, COVID started happening. And so we started looking into what we could do to kind of help people negotiate. So, um, the middle picture is a picture of Jean Brett. She's a brilliant negotiator and the one that started the negotiation curriculum at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Business. Um, and so what she did is she suggested, hey, there's this really cool software that's AI based um, that you can actually use to teach people how to negotiate. So we built a website. We received NIH R01 funding to build a website, which is this, and we actually have didactic lectures. Each one lasts less than 10 minutes um, with different, you know, how to plan for negotiation, what tactics should you use, you know, a geriatrics perspective. We always try to test cognition before we start going into a negotiation because then the person will never remember your negotiation, right? <laughs> they'll agree and then at the end they'll be like, what, what? Um, and then we actually show a model of how you can negotiate successfully. After learning about it, we actually push people into these exercises. So you get randomized into an exercise that's one of four categories. Um, you can negotiate with a provider, you can negotiate with a senior, you negotiate with another family member because we saw a lot of families having difficulties with siblings, et cetera. We always have one in a family, right? Um, and then we actually made harder versions of them. Um, so. This is the Iago system that has been used and designed by Dr. Mel, and he was one of our co-investigators on this grant out of University of Central Florida. Um, brilliant um, designer when it comes to human aware computer agents. So you actually will be, you actually are able to negotiate with an avatar um, that responds to you with emotion. So it's not a chat, GT, or chat GPT version because that cannot construe emotion. 
um, but this one can, and it actually can reflect back on your emotion and respond. So it's very much a human aware computer agent. Um, and from that, um, we are doing a multi-site most trial um, where people are getting uh, the education, the tools, and then they're getting randomly assigned to different negotiation exercises using a full factorial design. Um, because ultimately we're trying to make this as potent as possible. Um, and right now we've recruited 95 out of like the 150 that we're going after. So we're right on schedule and hopefully we'll be able to roll this out um, to everyone um, in the coming year. And so um, our glorious purpose has been to plan ahead to age in place so that when a senior enters the hospital, I know that if I'm admitted, and this has actually been my patients, which I love. Um, so one of my patients came in and they're like, this is a Lindquist patient. I know that if I'm admitted, I may need subacute rehab and I have chosen three different facilities that I prefer. Can you imagine being an admitting attending and getting a patient to tell you that? You're like, love you, that's awesome. Uh -huh. So, um, and then we've also had family members that say, you know, if my mom goes home, I have the home caregiver agency that she wishes mm -hmm. to be a caregiver and she's agreeable to it. Cause that's the goal is to make it easier for people to get the right care. Um, so I'm just gonna take a few seconds to talk about the next steps and what's happening at Northwestern because with all these branches occurring in the timeline, how do we connect it all? And that was kind of the Loki last season where he's trying to connect all the timelines. Um, and just to give you an understanding of what's been happening at Northwestern, um, we pretty much had to go from the ground up. Um, and so with two people. So when I started as section chief in November of 2011, there was only two geriatricians. There was myself and Dr. G. McCoy, who became our geriatrics fellowship director. Um, we had a mass exodus because we had changes in our incentive comp um, uh, setup. We went from a socialist um, where the older docs got as much money as they wanted to a eat what you treat. So it worked for the younger doctors. I loved it. I was like, wow, my paycheck bumped. Um, but the older doctors didn't like giving me money. Um, so they left. Um, and so there's two people, what do you do? You're the chief. Um, so let's do it. Let's build Northwestern geriatrics into an age friendly health system. So I got named executive director of senior services across the health system. And subsequently over the years, we've developed a geriatrics emergency department. We've always had geriatric outpatients clinics. Um, we have a geriatrics home care program, um, as well as a geriatric staffed skilled nursing facilities. And this is actually the gentleman on the bike is my 73 year old nurse practitioner, Dwayne, um, who bikes around in winter doing home visits. It's impossible to get parking in Chicago downtown. So we end up biking and we actually have little purple bikes with the Northwestern emblem on them. Um, a couple of our seats have been stolen, but it's life, you know. Um, so our geriatric emergency department, um, it was originally funded through a CMS innovations grant. Um, and I will tell you, it was easy to become age friendly when you have the money and the people above you listening to you. So I've actually earned about $53 million in research funding for Northwestern over the years. Um, and so one of the big grants that we got was a CMS innovations grant where we actually trained um, geriatric, um, we trained nurses to become geriatricians. And so they evaluate seniors in the ER to go home. Um, and then they are connected to home-based services and they coordinate with the primary care provider. The hardest uh, part of this was actually convincing the providers that the patients could go home um, because we had a lot of emergency room doctors that were adverse to risk. But once they got to understand that it's better for a senior to be cared for at home than in the hospital, and these nurses were on top of the care and had everything set up, they were more willing to send the patients home. And so we actually reduced unnecessary admissions by one third for seniors. And we limited incorrect medication use in polypharmacy as well as increasing the use of home-based services. And we've actually become a national training center where other groups have come uh, to train on building a geriatric emergency department. Um, like I said, we've got our home care program. Um, Dwayne's up top, and we actually do most of our um, traveling uh, in the city on bicycles. Um, Divi bikes is another part. Um, we actually use a lot of micro gear um, with devices weighing less than eight pounds total. Um, so think about that. Think about how small we can get it. Um, so we have our EKG machine that's usable with our phone, um, a lot of different things we do with the mobile apps nowadays. 
Um, and so we received referrals from the geriatric emergency department as well as outpatient providers. And then we also have a high utilizer program. Um, and we've seen reductions in hospitalizations and decreased readmissions, et cetera. Um, and so we've got expansion was approved and we keep on adding new people. So these are some of our um, docs that we have seeing home care. Like I said, we also have inpatient outpatient consultation. Um, our outpatient consultation or outpatient geriatrics, uh, we actually opened up a satellite clinic in Deerfield and we also have another one opening up in the fall in Evanston. Um, so we keep on expanding our reach. Um, we also are playing with the virtual memory clinic that's gonna be in the West region. Um, and then as um, most programs, we do have a consult service. Ours is not really as, as awesome as yours. I'll be first to say you guys have an awesome consult service. And then we've actually also have a post-acute skilled nursing facility network where Northwestern geriatricians catch patients from the hospital. Um, most of our facilities, we take patients from all hospitals. So it's not that we're just caring for Northwestern alone. Um, but we have a common EPIC EHR use between the hospitals and facilities, and then there's coordination of transfers. One of the nice things is that if we ever want to transfer a patient back from a nursing home to a, a, the hospital, say a person falls in the nursing home and we just want a CAT scan of the head, we can actually contact the Jedi nurses. That's their nickname, Jedis, by the way. Because um, who doesn't want to be a Jedi, right? You know, so they have lightsabers and everything. Um, and so we actually can call the Jedi nurses and let them know we just need a CAT scan and send them back. You don't need to admit them for, you know, mental status changes. Um, one of the other things that we've looked at too is discharge to home. Um, our goal is to enable older adults to return home. And what we found is that people were going home from a hospitalization after, um, before or during COVID. So why can't we send more patients home? Um, and so we're tackling that right now as well. Um, and um, lastly, we actually were lucky enough to receive a Claude Pepper Center. So if anyone's interested in collaborating in research, um, I'm one of the leaders of that um, and we can contribute to the advancement of aging research for that. So overall, our glorious purpose, or my glorious purpose is designing a health system to support seniors aging in place. And um, this was a list of all of our geriatricians and researchers, et cetera. Uh, so we've gone from two people to the universe. Um, I like to be proud of our team. And that's what I kind of think about is how do we spread geriatrics to more places? How do we get it going further? Um, one of my favorite pastimes has been um, to try to get out on social media. Um, you can take your choice. Um, when we announced that we were becoming a separate division, so we actually became a separate division about two years ago. Um, we actually had about 66,000 impressions uh, of that tweet. Um, we've done some Twitter spaces live, um, primarily just to get information out there because there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation about geriatrics. And what many people might not realize is that my original claim to fame, which received 145 million views, is the best retirement care plan ever. So my first research project out of fellowship, I said, why don't we put seniors on nursing? Seniors can go and live on a cruise ship for the same price as assisted living, huh. right? Yeah. I actually loved cruising. I cruised like a lot when I was single um, and with my families and so forth, or my parents. And so they're older parents. So we cruised a lot. And I said, you know, I'm on these cruise ships and they look surprisingly like my clinic and assisted livings, right? Like you go there, they've got, a, you know, literally like a lineup of scooters um, in any one hallway. And so I said, let's figure out if we can do it. And so I actually did a Markov analysis, which is an analytical method where you can use a population of people living in assisted living and a pop population of people living on a cruise ship. And I showed that it was the same price um, that you could live on a cruise ship um, at the same uh, cost. So that took off. Um, and imagine being like one year out of fellowship and I was assigned a media team. I got interviewed by Oprah's production team. I was on CNN, MSNBC, and I had like, you know, over a hundred different media sources um, that wanted to interview me over two weeks. Um, and my research has subsequently gotten 145 million views. So whenever you hear people say, I want to go live on a cruise ship, that's my research. Okay. I know, isn't that wild? And I'm just like a little Midwesterner. So that's what's fun. 
So if anything that you gained from today, have fun on your timeline um, and feel free to deviate anytime you want. So I'm open for questions um, and let's chat. Guys, yay. Questions? Can you talk a little bit more about the training program that you export to other places for the Jerry ED? Oh yeah, so it's it's actually fully designed to be flexible. Um, so we actually have like a one week so one week of didactics, which we've converted to virtual. Um, so people will go through different lectures, almost like a mini geriatric fellowship. Um, and then on top of that, um, after that time, it depends on the needs and also the monies of the programs that we're doing, um, because there's some smaller hospitals that want it that don't have much money. And then there's some larger hospitals that want it for their health system. Mm -hmm. So we've had teams that have flown in and come to Northwestern and stayed with us for two weeks, um, where they actually will get to come to the geriatric clinic. They'll get to go to different nursing homes, see how it is. And then they'll shadow our ED people and our Jedi. Literally, they need to shadow the Jedi nurses. Um, from that, we actually give them a list, or we actually give them the almost the epic package, because um, we've got it kind of what cognition tests they're using, you know, what depression. It's not rocket science. If you're a good geriatrician, you can do it. Um, but then we get to see how the they get to see how the Jedi's do it, um, and then they actually follow up with you know, um, the Jedi's will actually be assigned to one team. Um, and then they'll be available for them to meet, you know, every two weeks, once a month if needed. Um, so it's just something there. Um, and so, yeah, we've been lucky. Sometimes we've done it smaller. Um, sometimes we've done it bigger, just depending on the health system. Do you have to create a login in order to save your work? on the Yes, that's the thing. So um, you can come in as guest, but you can't um, save it. That's the only thing. You can print it and you can do everything. Um, the reason we did the save function is because people wanted to come back to it. Um, they wanted to look into it more. They wanted to think about it, yeah. hang out with their you know, spouse, talk about it more, and they didn't want to restart. Mm -hmm. um, so we offer a save function as well as a guest. So if they want to just come back to a separate section. Um, what's kind of fun is that I've talked to some people who are in very like rural Montana or North Dakota, and they don't always have a social worker. So they're like, oh, I just go to that website and I type it in and I find out where my, you know, thing is that I can find them or what caregiver agencies are nearby. Um, and we've also seen people that are using it that are distant caregivers. So let's say the mom lives in Florida and the daughter lives in New York and she wants to find out what's in that area. So she's able to pull it up. Um, sometimes people will do it together too um, as another way of doing it, but either option is available. Yeah. I apologize if I missed this, but how are you finding out about resources all over the country? Oh, there's actually websites. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? So there's national websites, okay. um, but there's never been a one source for it, yeah. which is where Plan Your Lifespan comes in handy because not many people know about villages, right? You know what I mean? But there's a national website for villages where you can click and see where it is and get the contact information. Um, you know, where is your local area agency on aging? What is an area agency? You know, not even people, people don't even realize that those exist. So we see a lot of seniors in need, right? Um, and so once the daughter finds out about it, can call, you know, boom. And so there's actually a national aging or national area aging and uh, resource page. Okay. Um, other thing too, people- to be like, so I'm just thinking of like yeah. really small local programs that maybe don't have a strong internet presence or maybe aren't. No, it's actually, you know what, so work. it actually is a like a .gov website that gives you a list of all of them. Um, and so when you type in your zip code, they we've programmed it so it gives you like the nearest three okay. to that zip code. Um, and then this, there's a I think phone number and then the link to it if you want to go and visit it. Okay. Um, so yeah, and same with nursing home compare, not many people realize that was out there for figuring out what nursing homes are in their area. Um, and so we usually tell people pick more than one, um, uh, just in case, you know, you're not into that one or something's changed and we'll see people since we've been following people for many months now, um, we're actually seeing people revisit it and think about it, change their mind. I don't want to go to this nursing home. It changed hands. I want to go to the one that Dr. Bergman works at because he's awesome. Um, so that's the fun bit, you know, that people are changing their plans instead of making one final change or that something. patients find a local geriatrician or a geriatrician? No, we couldn't do the geriatrician one because we didn't want to connect it to medical. We wanted okay. to do more about planning to age in place. 
Um, so we, it's not connected to find your local geriatrician because we need more geriatricians. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was just the, we didn't want to get too large. Yeah. yeah. We've had questions where, you know, could you connect me? One of the biggest feedbacks, which we just couldn't do local lawn care agencies. Oh. And I'm like, there's no national website. <laughs> it was a local lawn care agency. So yeah, we had a lot of little feedback. We're like, we just can't get there. So we only wanted to connect to national agencies. Um, that we knew were reputable and would be around for a while. Mike, do we have the link for our epic? He hasn't been on the patient pages. Yeah, see. I don't, I don't know. know. Like, no, you do actually. You? So yeah, it's on national. So um, national page. So it's actually, it's it's anybody who's installed epic has it. Okay. Um, and it's on the bottom right of the patient faxing pages. So if you, yeah, yeah so if you go on to your my NM account because or whatever your pages are, mm -hmm. as a patient, um, you'll be able to find it at the bottom. Okay. Um, of the resource pages for end of life. Okay. So it's interesting. We actually can track where people are hitting it, um, and we see people coming through Epic on that route. Okay. My question. Oh, you're awesome. Yeah. Um, how long is the training on negotiation that you did with hospitalists. Oh my God. So it's an hour long. Oh, I know. So that's why this morning I was like a, a, a medical um, resident rounds. Cause I do it for the residents. I'm like, Oh, I could have done my resident talk, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it's what we did for the in-person or you could do it by zoom is um, it's uh, th it's like 20 minutes of lecture. And then we give you a case and the case is like taking the keys away from a senior. Um, right. And then one person pretends to be the senior, one person pretends to be the doctor, or they can rotate whatever. And then we, um, you know, just finish it. We talk about how people did what should have been done, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, one of the big things with negotiation is the more you do it, the better you get. So what we encourage is people to gain those skills and then go out and use them. Um, cause the more you use it, and this is even with, um, with business training is that the more you negotiate, the better you are. So stop avoiding, you can do it. Um, and actually for resources, the negotiate age resource, it's, that's the title of the other website is negotiate age. Um, you can actually look at those resources. That's not part of the, the research process. So if and you want to, yeah, they're public. Mm -hmm. The um, avatars thing we have to control for, for the research, but it's just what it is. Question in the back. So, um... Speaking of negotiation, so uh, often geriatrics departments are very linked to health systems in terms of decreasing admissions or readmissions or decreasing length of stay or putting social outcomes. And so you mentioned that you really work across systems with a lot of work that you do. So talk to us about, about that and, and does it get thorny with some of the relationships there? Um. Yeah, so the question that was asked is, you work with a lot of different health systems. Um, does it get thorny? Yeah, it does get thorny. Um, but I will say one of my um, things is that I don't really um, give up. So I always feel like this is kind of the negotiation training. You can propose something to a group and they'll be like, I don't know about it. So then you keep reiterating, let's try it. And sometimes when they say no, it's all about repackaging it to what they want. I think that's something that comes out a lot in medicine and as a researcher is that how you present for research is a lot different than how you present for a business person. Um, if I take care of your mom and you're the CEO of the hospital, like you're gonna love my program even though it's a one person, right? Um, versus me showing how I'm showing significant effects with this. Um, I will say the one thing that has been really helpful is that our home care program has been really beneficial to people. So if you have an innovative program that's benefiting people, um, that's usually an easy sell um, because people want it. Um, one of the other fun things too, is that people always, I always try to align myself with people who wanna do the right thing. Um, maybe not necessarily for money, but if you wanna take care of your patients and you wanna take care of your seniors and you want the seniors to be treated like your parents or your grandparents, then that's an executive I want on my side. Um, so it's finding the right person in the right area. And we've pulled out of some nursing homes. We've pulled out of some areas that we didn't have a good moral match with, I would say. Um, but that just comes with it where, you know, you have to accept, okay, if I say no to this giant contract, will I find something else? And that's been my luck so far. So fingers crossed. Um, but 
yeah, I hope that helps. There's no easy answer. Yeah. Have, have you had success in getting health systems other than Northwestern to subsidize some of the work of your geriatricians? On? Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about like nursing homes, um, yes. If you're talking about like Northwestern just recently bought like three new hospitals. Um, and so each one of those are kind of playing with us on what they can afford, what they're willing to pay and what they want. Um, so I've only worked in at Northwestern. I'm a Chicagoan born and bred. So I really haven't gotten the scope to ask money from Christian or Peter. But if you think I should, I will. <laughs> I was gonna say nobody has money. So like if anything, it's finding the person who has the money. And usually academic systems like, you know, that are university based, they're they're scrimping and saving. So <laughs> Any other questions? So thank you. Oh yeah, go ahead, sorry. Um, I saw in one of the slides, you mentioned the hospital at home program as well. Is that run by geriatric? But... Yeah, hospital at home. We had a great dinner yesterday. Hospital at home is a work in progress um, because our JEDI program um, would like to have it leveraged from them naturally, right? Because they can see the patient, they know which patients can go home. So they feel strongly about it. The trickiness is that the hospitalists are the experts in hospital medicine, so they'd like to be involved. Um, but at the end of the day, the geriatricians are in the home um, and also know more about the EPIC outpatient system. So right now we're trying to realign the program so that everyone is happy. And that's tricky. So it's a work in progress for sure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me, you guys. This has been a great time and I enjoy talking with so many people. So thank you. And feel free to come to Chicago anytime. It's a, it's a fun place. Thank you. Thank you.